I shared just in this last class in number 17 with um, a little more along that line. And, and remember, we were in John 12, 24, and we saw, you know, uh, chief, chief leaders and whatever that uh, said they believe in Jesus, but they didn't, you know, they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue and they didn't want to die to bring forth life. They were afraid of that or they were, you know, not in tune with that. <clears throat> and yet Jesus had just declared a few verses in front of that at the height of his uh, exaltation in the earth that he's going to go to the cross and die for others. And that's how, and, and not just that, but that's how he's going to bring forth fruit. And how incredible is that? <clears throat> All right. So uh, I, I want to sort of cons- uh, continue that, but in different scriptures this time. I want to go to John 10. <clears throat> so if you'll turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. <clears throat> And the next class that I teach, and I do want to say this, if I end up skipping any classes, and if it's okay with with Jim and the powers that be, uh, if I end up being gone, and I will be traveling a lot, um, I'd like to make them up either on a Sunday night or something like that, because these classes to me are so, so important. And I I feel like there's some witnesses coming in chapter 8 and 9 and 10 we don't want to miss and I just believe it's the Lord and you don't hear me go on very much like that I just really believe that it is all right John chapter 10 now a lot of times when we think about John chapter 10 we have this picture of us you know of Jesus being the good shepherd and of how he's petting and holding the sheep and he's the good shepherd and he watches out for us and he chases off the wolf and oh and everything's so wonderful and he leads us in and out and and that sort of thing but a lot of times what we don't see is Christ crucified and this this chapter and this this uh, example here of the good shepherd is full of that But it is also, uh, another angle of it is something that we don't see, really, a lot of times, we don't notice that, is that it is also has a contrast to Christ crucified. And so it is basically, you could say, based on the class that we've been having, it is a contrast of the wisdom of God, Uh, uh, or the power of God through weakness or the wisdom of God through appearing as foolish by being crucified, taken advantage of, that sort of thing. Um, And that's in contrast to the wisdom of this world. And uh, I was thinking about it today, how, how the wisdom of the world, there's a lot of people that have money and everything and power and position and all that and they will do good stuff for people along the way but they're but one thing that won't change is they're always looking out for number one you understand what i'm saying even when they're helping other people they're really and if anything comes in conflict with them being number one or whatever that's when they stop doing what they're doing and um uh, we, get, we can see some of these contrasts here. John 10, verse 10. The thief comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. All right. So let's break this down. Let's break it down into uh, uh, the wisdom of God and the wisdom of this age. Let's break it down into... Uh, Christ crucified or people that uh, despise having their reputation ruined or looking bad or whatever. Uh, Let's break it down into the crucifiers and the crucified. In verse 10, the thief comes to kill. You see it there? It's written right there. The thief comes to kill. Verse 11, Jesus came to be killed. All right, that's undeniable, folks. 
that immediately throws this thing into the realm of Christ crucified and, thro and throws the, the contrast into the realm of, you know, in this case with the thief, into the realm of, look, I'll, I'll kill, I'll destroy, I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know, do whatever I have to do to gain what I want. And, and I've got some of those contrasts here. The thief comes to take life. But in verse 11, Jesus comes to give life and give it more abundantly. <clears throat> I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Um, verse 10, how do, you, how do they get that life? How do they get life and get it more abundantly? <clears throat> verse 11, he gives his life and death for them so that they can have it. Okay? Christ crucified. Why? Why is it this method? Because it is God's nature to give. For God so loved the world, he gave. What did he give? He didn't just give, you know, I've used the example many times, you know. We say, well, you know, let's give, let's give clothes to the poor. And so everybody would bring their worst stuff, their useless, torn, let's, hey, I'm giving this, you know. And we did that on Bolivar once, and Scott and Carol were there at the time. And I said, we, we will not do this. We'll give your best. Go in your closet and find your best, your good stuff. And I was blessed. They did. And we were able to really, really give. Because God didn't just give some old raggedy, low-class angel. He gave his son. You know, some little dorky angel in the corner of heaven or something like that. Come here, buddy. You know, and he gave his son. Um, so how does the thief get what he wants? He steals it. He kills for it. He destroys it. Verse 12, uh, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose uh, own the sheep or not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth them. <clears throat> so the verse 12 starts with the word but. And it sounds to me like the thief and the wolf are the same person. Okay, at least they're very similar in their way. <clears throat> um, uh, so uh, but in this verse also, the hireling is introduced. And it's interesting, I don't, I don't know if you've ever did a, done a study of this to see the different people mentioned here. I mean, you got the thief, you got the wolf, you got the stranger uh, whose voice you won't hear, you've got the uh, hireling, you get so many things here, you know, <clears throat> and uh, different attributes of them. So the, the hireling is introduced here. And he's not a wolf. His problem, I, I'm just trying to read what I wrote here. His problem is, though he won't kill others and will, not put, uh, and will put others first in good times, when the hour and power of darkness comes, which is the hour of the cross, folks, he will not lay down his life to be slaughtered. Life only comes out of death. They won't take the shame or the blame of Christ crucified. When they see the cross come, when they see the hour and power of God, oh, no, 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 you know, and they'll let others be slaughtered then, and they won't stand up for them or take, the, take it into themselves, you know, absorb that into themselves and be the scapegoat. <clears throat> and um, so they're not like the, the hireling is not the wolf. Can you see that? <clears throat> the hireling, actually, um, <clears throat> I think, this is my opinion, I don't think that we know he's a hireling until the wolf comes. Because I don't think he's on the street corner, you know, hireling will work for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lamb chops or something. <laughs> You know, I don't think that's going on. I think that his resume says shepherd. You with me? <clears throat> we don't know. Nobody knows what you are until the cross comes. Is that right? Until we're presented with the loss of our reputation, when we're presented with the loss of our finances, when we're presented with the loss of, of all of those things, and in, not just the loss of them, folks, heaped 
on you with accusations that are absolutely not who you are or anything like it. I'm thinking of Jesus now. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, uh, he hath a demon. And, you know, I didn't even get into those scriptures, but that was uh, last class that it went into that, you know. There was a division among them. He hath a demon. He's got this and that. You know, oh, what, it's, it, one verse said, not only has a demon, but he's mad. He's crazy. He's insane. Folks, the wisdom of Christ crucified, the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom is like insane philosophy or something. It's like, this is just insane. And again, I don't, I don't freak out when people don't get it. I, uh, you know, even among you, I say, uh, you know, if you don't get this, if this rubs you wrong, you know, forget it, you know, come back when you've seen it from God, but do not try to measure up or have it happen in you until you've seen something from the Lord. <clears throat> All right, so, um, um, life only comes out of death, but they won't take the shame or the blame of Christ crucified. <clears throat> then verse 13 says, The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. And I think that the wolf is God's test. You could say that the cross is God's test. You could, you could say that Instead of, you know, I'm using last class now, instead of taking someone to court who is wrong and proven that they're wrong, what Paul said was, why would you do that? You're, you know, you're violating Christ crucified. Why not just take the blame yourself? Um, the wolf is God's test. It's, and it doesn't, it, what it does is it just shows the difference between shepherds or those who, you know, I'll just say those who are, yes. You're saying about the hireling. He is just that, but he's a hireling and he's in it for himself. But also, you'll notice in that verse that the sheep, uh, the wolf then scatters the sheep. <coughs> the sheep thought they belonged to this hireling. They didn't know the correct voice. Right, that's right. And that's really the, the first, like verse 1 through 9 is all about knowing that voice. <clears throat> um, all right, so uh, the, the wolf proves that caring for others proves in the hireling that he's not a true shepherd. And the proof of that is that, uh, that caring for others is conditional and that I come first. I mean... I'm in this until it's going to get ready. Cost me. Oh, man, folks. Jesus started the whole thing off by telling you to count the cost. And he said, here's what it's going to start with. Here's how we start. If any man follow me, take up the cross. He didn't say follow me. He said, if you're going to follow me, take up the cross. That taking up the cross was first. You don't even hear you know, most people's example of taking up the cross anyway is, you know, their old sick grandmother or something. She's my cross, or you know what I mean? That wife that you gave me, that's my cross, you know what I mean? Or something like that. That's not your cross. That's your stupidity for marrying them. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> and I wonder why people don't like me. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, titles have been given, but self has not yet been removed because the hireling is, has not been called a hireling yet. He was hired on as shepherd, and he carries that title, but self has not yet been taken out of the sender. And, you know, let's just make this clear. How do you get self out of the sender? Well, it's impossible. You'll never, ever get self out of the sinner. Self must be crucified with Christ. Okay, you can't, I mean, first of all, who's going to take self out of the sinner? Self? <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> self will not dethrone self. That's just the way that it is. 
And, you know, we talk about the strongest instinct is self-survival. No, the strongest instinct is self. You can dash survival or self anything. Whatever comes out of self, that's the strongest instinct. You see how that's, that's true. <clears throat> All right, verse uh, 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. All right, so he knows us and we know him. He is Christ crucified, the one who dies for the sheep, because that's what he's been talking about, hasn't it? The only picture that he's given us that we can know him beyond title of shepherd is, I give my life for the sheep. So we know him. He's the one who lays down his life for something even less than him, a man for a sheep. A, a, a lamb for a jackass, like in the Old Testament. <clears throat> um, something greater is the redemption. Again, if you're going to redeem a jackass, if you're going to redeem a donkey, it would cost you a lamb. If you're going to save that sheep, it's going to cost you a shepherd. See, that means that in God's economy, it's a true godly sacrifice when something greater lowers itself and dies for something lesser. All right. <clears throat> um, so he's... He said he knows us and we know him. He's the crucified one, the one who dies for the sheep. We are known as sheep, the primary animal choice fit for the altar. Shall we read it again? Uh, uh, verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. They know him. Only if you go by this chapter as the one who gives his life for the sheep. He knows us not as you know, uh, Randy in this way and you in that way and da-da-da-da. He knows us as sheep, the primary animal chosen of God for Israel's altar. He knows us. We know him. <clears throat> Verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, so the Father knows Jesus, and he knows the Father right? They, they are self-giving in nature. I lay down my life for the sheep. That's, that's what the verse that goes on to say. He says, I know the Father and the Father knows me. I lay down my life for the sheep. They know each other in this self-giving way. This is God. This is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and their interactions with one another. It's all they've known from eternity past and it'll be all they truly know of one another forever. I know the Father, and the Father knows me. I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay. <clears throat> um, this is how they are. Uh, this is how they are known to each other, and this is how we are to be known by people. And I, you don't have to turn there, but I'll just read um, John. Uh, still in John, but I'll just read this for you. Um, <clears throat> A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Not that you love one another, but you love as I have loved. And how does he love? For God so loved the world that he gave his own. Um, how do we love? By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down, and we ought to lay down. Okay? Verse 35, by this shall all men know that we are his disciples if we have this kind of love one toward another. Okay, So when he's talking about he knows us, we know him, this is how we're known, this is how you'll be known Okay, <clears throat> by Christ crucified. Um, <clears throat> verse uh, 16, <clears throat> and other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. <clears throat> so I wrote down, and uh, <clears throat> I think Nisi sort of shared on this in one of her classes in relationship to the true vine, but I'm coming at it from a sheep angle here. 
Uh, he has other sheep who are sheep and are his, but they have not joined the pen that leads to the altar. Because remember, the pen, this, you remember during the conference last year when I shared on the sheep gate? And it was an agricultural society, and they primarily raised sheep. They were shepherds, and you can see this all over the scriptures, and it would be mind-blowing if you just went on to search David and, and Joseph and on and on and on and on. <clears throat> uh, well, in their, their society, they raised sheep for the altar primarily because they sacrificed incredible amounts of sheep. I mean, every time somebody sinned, if you offered a, sheep, a lamb, it's, that's going to be a lot, you know what I'm saying? I mean, just you in this last week, how many lambs would have, you know? <laughs> That'll help you understand that we're talking about a lot here. <laughs> All right. Um, so he has other sheep who are sheep, and, um, and they are his, but they have not joined to the pen that leads to the altar yet. They're, see, he's not talking about those that he's being able to lead in or out or whatever at this stage to the altar. But he's talking about they are his, they just don't know this crucified life yet. Okay? Um, first, they need to hear his voice, and that also includes... Uh, Verse 4, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Well, you know, I'm just going to say it like this. The sheep follow him. What do we always get from that? Well, I got news for you. That he's going to the altar. He's going to the cross. Right? I mean, remember they tried to stop him in Samaria, and he wouldn't stay, and they got mad at him? Well, who do you think you are? And he said... The scripture says his face was set at a, as a flint toward Jerusalem because he was going there to die. Okay. You, you want to follow Jesus? You want to be one of his sheep? Well, you're going to follow him to the altar. My sheep know my voice, and they follow me. And, um, and then he says that right here. Another sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also must bring. Them, I, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. <clears throat> uh, that voice will bring them to the place of death, meaning it will bring them to the place of oneness with Christ crucified. And in that, they will not, once you're one with him, you're not going to be a thief. You're not going to be a hireling. You're not going to be a stranger. All of these mentioned here, you're not going to be a wolf. You're going to be one. And oneness is to be one with the crucified in his spirit and you follow him we know because he see he's not the interesting thing there is jesus is not talking about the sheep dying he's talking about the sheep following him he's talking about him dying but if he's going to die where are they going to follow him to i mean i'm not i don't think i'm making that up i think it's pretty pretty obvious what the scriptures are saying you just have to see it but <clears throat> You know, there's been such a romantic picture about being his sheep and him being the shepherd and, you know, him petting us and then going, oh, I got a little tick there. Let me get it, you know. Oh, you're such a good shepherd, you know. You know, so, well, okay, let's get up. I'm heading toward the altar. <laughs> what? You know, and then we see it wasn't a sheep at all. It was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Still like... Like what I'm sharing here? <laughs> I'm supposed to say, no, I never have, but it's the Lord. <laughs> All right, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life. Whoa! Therefore doth my Father love me because. Is that only impacting to me? I about jumped out of my skin. I went 
that says it. That's what God honors above everything. When God sees something, he falls in love with that which lays down its life, which sacrificially gives itself up for someone lesser or someone hurting or someone, you know, that's ungodly. And I can hear Jesus saying, I'll tell you why he loves me so much, because I am self-giving in my way. And I know you could take that a million other ways. Well, does that mean God doesn't love sinners? No, he loves sinners enough to die for them. But he loves the one who's dying for him because he's selfless. Does that? Thanks, Greg. <laughs> so I wrote this selfless, this selfless giving is what the Father loves so much. Verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of the Father. And I don't think the magnitude of what I shared in the Philippians class has hit too much of us. I think maybe just barely it's starting. And I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody down or, or anything. I'm just saying there's a, there is within this thing of having rights, and, and we'll really get into that in the ninth chapter where, where Paul just, whoosh, man, it's powerful. That's why we gotta, we got to keep going until we get through a certain part of this. <clears throat> having rights, folks, I, I have been guilty, and I repent. I have been wrong. I have said before, surely somewhere on some tape, I know it is there, I have said that if you're dead, you have no rights. You're dead, so quit. Anybody remember me saying that? Folks, I have, I have to reverse what I'm saying there because I have seen absolutely, positively that part of the beauty of Christ crucified is, is that he has rights as God. He has the right to be God. As, as God here, he has the right to live and not lay down his life. As, as a, a, a citizen of Rome, you have the right to go to court and take someone to court. As a, as a husband or wife, you have a right to da-da-da-da. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I have been overwhelmed, not just, you know, wow, that's mildly interesting. I mean, overwhelmed with the fact that a huge part of this reality of Christ crucified, and you're not going to fully grasp it until you see it in light of Jesus had every right, and he laid down his rights. Being in the form of God, he put himself in the form of man. Okay? Well, you, in this case, you only lay down your rights because of Christ, because that's your nature. You see what I'm saying? You lay it down. And that's what Jesus says right here. I have the right to lay it down or to take it. I can do whatever I want. I lay it down on myself. See, Although, here's that word, although, remember we wrote it. It's not always written there. I'm just telling you, if you could somehow take it off the board from last class and write it in your brain, because that's kind of what the Holy Spirit has done with me. I see in that scripture right there, Although I have the rights not to lay down my life, I choose to lay down my life. In fact, what was my wording there? Uh, <clears throat> Jesus has rights and he has power. But he foregoes that. And then I just wrote Philippians 2. The although or though in the form of God, He lays it down. Although in the form of man, he becomes a servant. Although a servant, he becomes obedient to death on the cross. Every one of those is a step in Christ crucified to bring about the enemies, the very murderers, to the glory of God, to, uh, to sonship. Paul was the chief among them, hater of Jesus and the, the people of God. Why, why would 
why would Jesus, why would you care about anybody that was just full of malice and just lied about you and did stuff? Why would you care about somebody like that? Well, you wouldn't. You would, you know, they did, this, you know, it's like a chess game. They made this move. I have to offset that move or people are going to believe I'm the bad one. I have to prove that they're bad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Bunch of holy people. Don't give me that. <laughs> You know, Jesus goes and hunts down Paul, the hater of Jesus, and makes him, a, makes him an apostle. And Paul walks around going, I don't, I am just the least of, I persecuted the body of Jesus. I, I shouldn't, I mean, I got chills all over me because of the magnitude of, and I don't even claim to have seen that to any fullness, but what little I have seen of it just shakes me to my being because I see what happened to that man. And I see how it formed his, his doctrine, his theology, no, his life into Christ crucified. His life was formed into it. <clears throat> Verse 19. Oh, here's where I was talking about it. I was talking about it as if it was in one of the last classes. It's right here. <clears throat> uh, verse 19. After Jesus says all this, okay, I'm, okay, now here, you got to get the picture leading up to this, though, okay? I'm the good shepherd. I give my life. Uh, they have come to kill, and they will kill me. <laughs> I have come to die. They're not taking my life. I lay it down willingly. I lay it down also. And I think, you know, I think Jesus, you know, I'm just going to say that, I, I, you know, I think if I was Jesus, I would not just see what we would consider all the good people that deserve the Lord that I'm going to die for. I think he sees the wolf. I think he sees the hireling that runs away and allows his own body to be slaughtered. I think he sees the thief, the, the thief and, and the, the hireling. And the, you know, I think he sees all of that. And he sees what they are. But it doesn't change love. It doesn't change Christ crucified, it doesn't change the nature of God. That, um, I forget the exact wording right now in Romans 5, but um, that by love he died for the ungodly, you know. Not by righteousness or anything else, but it was love. And, and again, uh, while I believe that Christ crucified is to be, you know, a dumb wording here, reanimated into us and therefore brought forth time and time again through his body, I don't believe that this is for everybody because of the contrast and the clash of the wisdom of this age that is repugnated and repelled by even the suggestion that this is a valid way of proceeding. And it's stupid to try to reason with a mind that eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard. There is no way that they even have a clue what this is about. There's no way. They, they cannot comprehend. That's what it, all those verses about, you know, the carnal mind or the natural mind receiveth not. They, they, it's talking about Christ crucified. They don't get it. And to... Uh, while we can teach this as true and while we can do our best to conform, may, be made conformable to his death and the fellowship in his sufferings, um, you, we really have no right to try to shove this down anybody's throat. And I don't think we do anyway, but I'm just saying that we, it's, it's dangerous to do so. Yes. Multitudes that are there before the throne. 
Well, and I and that's that's what we don't what we don't mean by that is sectarianism. What we don't mean by that is some are more special than others. I, I'm going to be honest with you. That thing, and we hear it all the time, and I've heard it from day one. Day one. I mean, I'm talking when I was 21 years old, 22, something like that. When I first began to hear this, people say, well, who do you think you are? You think you're special, or you're elite, or you're this and that. Folks, if, if anyone comprehended what we're saying, you're, you're not only not elite, you're more dead than everybody else. You're out of the way. It's not about you. I mean, like, you know, like I said that time in, in Arkansas when I stood up and was preaching, I, you know, and I said, it's all about Jesus, and man, we're dead, we're nothing, da 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 and the guy got up and said, well, who do you think you are? <laughs> dead, for God's sake, aren't you listening? Does anybody hear me? But I, I am amazed, because, you know, now there is an identification with Christ, but it's all due to him, it's not us, do you understand what I mean? In other words, we're not just walking around going, Oh, I'm just worthless and nothing. You know, I'm just a zombie daddy. You know what I mean? If you could look like a zombie, like so that, well, does that make you feel better? I'm nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, but you're not a zombie. You're one with Christ, but Christ is the one to whom all glory goes. Okay? And, you know, and, and now I'll, I'll just add this a little bit. <clears throat> I have to watch my words, and I, but I can't catch everything, but I try to. <laughs> but I mean, I have to watch my words because, you know, every once in a while, even within the last couple of weeks, I've made a little statement or wrote something when I was writing something and went, oh, that could be met, read wrong. But you see, I can't spend my whole life thinking the way other people think. I'm trying to, you know, but I don't want to write things that would be a stumbling block either. But <clears throat> anyway. That's enough said about that, because I can't make it plain anyway. <laughs> all right, so all this has happened, and, and Jesus' last words here, let's, let's just read them again. Uh, um, verse 17 and 18, Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power, or I've got every right to, to lay it down and the ability, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. For the sayings that he's talking about, well, I'm going to die. He's not even asking anybody else to die. <laughs> he's, I'm, I'm going to live this way. This is the way I'm going to proceed. I feel good about this. Y'all, everybody else, feel free to strive to be great and famous and rich and powerful and, you know, step on people to get to your position and everything. Feel fine with that. But I lay down my life, and you know what? I choose to do that. Nobody's making me. I'm not in a cult or I'm not under the spell of, you know, Scott Moore or, you know what I mean? <laughs> Jim Allen or, you know, these, all of the Svengali's that we have here. <clears throat> Um, I choose to do that. And so when Jesus finishes saying that, they go, then there was a division among them. And, and it was over these sayings. These, I'm, I'm going to lay down my life. Well, they're like the, the thief. Well, we're going to kill you. We're going to help you, buddy. <laughs> That's good news because we don't like you. I don't know why you feel like you're a threat. I mean, we got priests with big robes and hats and walk around as holy and everything, and you look like a carpenter's son in a white robe and sandals and long hair and beard and look like a guy from Nazareth and everything. But I don't know, man. I don't know what the deal is, but you're going down. I'm glad you are offering to die because we're going to kill you. See? <clears throat> so here it is now. Now this is, I want you to catch this. This is a monumental contrast of the wisdom of this age with what just got spoken by Jesus in the two verses prior to these things and the 
the wisdom of God in a mystery, Christ crucified. Here's the saying. And many of them said, he hath a demon and is mad. Why do you people listen to him? Why hear him? Why do you people listen to this? <clears throat> All right. Um, you, you can't change that in people. And what comes to my mind, how much time we got left there? <clears throat> what comes to my mind is we go, uh, we could have a fear. <clears throat> we could say, oh my God, if I go this way, then people are going to want to kill me. But you know, it, first of all, don't go this way if that's what you're thinking. And I mean that, you know, save yourself the trouble. <laughs> but if it's Christ crucified revealed in you, you're going, oh boy, this is an opportunity. You know, I was, uh, I don't know, the Lord has, you know, Nisi's been my tutor in the book of Revelation for years, but within the past month, the Lord has just been opening up the book of Revelation to me. And, uh, and of course, I wandered off into it today. You know, I've got so much I got to do, but I, the Holy Spirit goes, hey, come here, I want to show you something. Look over here, you know, and he's talking about Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and, you know, that, that great... City, see, there are signs, greatness, lowliness, you know, self-exaltation, meekness, you know, weakness, strength. You, you get it? The two different uh, wisdoms. <clears throat> and it says, you know, oh, and it was dressed in fine purple and rich and wealth and the, all this stuff, but Babylon, and they're mourning over that and, and, and everything, and they're talking about how great it was. <clears throat> and... John and the, the, you know, this, I'll just say it like this because I don't have time and everything. The seven churches, man, who they're going through it, man. You read them seven churches in the first, and they got problems, and they're weak, and they're messed up. And they're, you, you know, come on, you look at the church, you go, these seven churches represent and all, you know, this is pitiful. Well, it's weakness, it's foolishness, it's, you know. Frailty, they are in areas messed up and in areas they've got the Lord and everything. This is God's standard in the earth. But when Babylon falls, they see, they understand God's strength is weakness. God's power is in weakness. God's wisdom is in self-giving and in loss and that sort of stuff. So when this beast falls they rejoice because they have been they've been under this you know what I mean I mean they're pushed down and they're going through all of this stuff but they're with you know to a certain level and the church still going today still with Christ crucified <clears throat> um, I don't want to go any more into that because I'm really just now starting to get into that particular <clears throat> thing. But just that contrast that is there with these weak, frail, even messed up, and yet that's God's church. And this thing that looks powerful and wonderful and has it together and smart, and boy, they know how to work the system and all this stuff, God hates it. God hates it. All right. <clears throat> um, so a division rose among them, and I put the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of this world, the same division in 1 Corinthians. Remember, the whole of 1 Corinthians, really the whole book, but for sure 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 uh, is all about the divisions, and the division isn't... The, Paul didn't like most Christians. I'm against division. Paul sees division as tearing down the temple of God. He sees it as Babylonians coming in and ripping the temple down, just like what happened in Jeremiah. He, that's how he sees it. He doesn't see it as division is not good. He sees it as the spirit of Babylon. And guess, what, guess who did it? Babylon. Guess who fell in Revelation? We were just talking Babylon. Same name. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like... 
do we not see what's happening here? And uh, um, so anyway, he, you know, he's not a religious man that says, well, I don't like division in the church. He doesn't see it as division among God's people. He sees God's people as God's temple, God's habitation, and somebody is tearing, dividing it down, and therefore destroying the temple. <clears throat> All right. So, um, then uh, verse 20, when he said, And many said, He hath a demon and is mad, and why hear ye him? <clears throat> Uh, wisdom of greatness and exaltation is against laying down its life. Because that was the last words of Jesus, and they said I, they got upset with his sayings about him laying down his life. He didn't even say to them, lay down your life. <laughs> he said, I'm going to lay down my life. Well, I don't like that. Just go away and be happy and be rich and famous. <laughs> Leave me alone. No, I want to. Because... Here's, here's the thing. When God makes himself vulnerable, chooses not to use his power, and becomes like a man where you can't tell that it's God, people will step on him too and to tr prove their greatness. You know? That vulnerability leads to that. Again... That, that shouldn't freak you out. And that, that was one of the things I was thinking why I said about Babylon when in the book of Revelation was, you know, I thought, well, you know, um, Babylon is falling. The people who do the ships are going, oh, no, it's over with. And the great, you know, all of the shipping and the trade and all of this. And they're talking about it in the whole. And it even talked about, uh, I can't remember the wording, but like, there would be no more light in the sense of, you know, all the power grid goes down and everything, and everybody's, I can just, I just, you know, I'm trying to picture, everybody's freaked out and everything, and then, you know, well, what are we going to do? I don't know if I want that on the phone. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I would do under that situation. But again, forget the prophetic future of it and think in terms of Christ crucified, that's your opportunity there. You're going to find lots of need and lots of opportunities to lay down your life, whereas you couldn't before because ever, the, the strength of that thing is, I don't know, I don't want to get into all that, but it's, you know, you're not afraid. So every time I say something, if I say Babylon is falling and what, you know, the grid's going to go offline and everything, if you go into fear, seek the Lord. Guess what? You probably don't fully grasp Christ crucified, and I'm not making a judgment, I don't know, maybe you are, maybe you're, but I'm just saying, you know, a lot of times the fears come up because the, the wisdom of this world and the system that has been set in place says by working hard to get income, you will be safe with income. And if the, if the economy goes bad and your income, goes, oh no, I'm not safe, it's replaced God there. I'm sorry I'm getting off on this stuff, but I'm not because this is the truth. And what I'm trying to say is I use these things as a barometer. If, if I'm studying some of this stuff and I fear a little fear going off in me, I realize that that is a, a sign that the wisdom of this world was still in control there, that if Christ crucified is my life, that Man, we'll go through that even if, you know, and, and there's not even a fear that you'll end up dying in it because you'll die giving yourself by Christ. But if you don't have that, you can't, as a leader or a teacher, I can't put that on you, you know. But like Jesus, I can put it on me. I choose to lay down my life. You, you, you see how, where I'm coming from when I say all of that? <clears throat> but that wasn't good enough for these guys. I mean, they are upset with Jesus. Uh, Jesus' wisdom makes him appear foolish to the point of being insane or demon-possessed. The, the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of Christ, makes him look insane. People on Skype, I know I look insane, okay? I know it. <laughs> what are they, rooting? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know that, you know, there are people that think I'm crazy, my wife, my kids. <laughs> 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 the 
the church, my dog. <clears throat> All right, that last verse. Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a demon. Don't you love that? They were, see, there's a division, but the, the, what is the true division? The division is the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of this age, and Christ crucified. And they're standing up for Jesus. I forget my word. Others who have their eyes open to the power of God in weakness stand up for Jesus. He is the lamb being slaughtered by these statements, but these men are not hirelings and don't run away. See how they say, he's not, they're standing for Jesus. It's Because really at that moment, he's not the shepherd. When they started attacking him, he was the lamb. He was the sheep. You see that? And, and so they're not a hireling and running away and letting these people just rip him to shred. They're going, man, you know, this, there's something to this. My spirit bears witness to this. And you know, our, we got to get beyond just our spirit bearing witness because our mind will override that many times. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. You know, you got to get to a place where you see it so clearly. And, and I mean like, like this, like what we've been doing here. And then Corinthians just going, you know, see how it just keeps saying it verse after, you know what I mean? And, and um, so what, what does that do? I mean, what does that do to want that knowledge, to want that understanding, to want that life, to want that spirit to work in you? What does that do to you to your pre in your present way of proceeding right now? Well, I don't know. Chris, what does that do to you? <laughs> it gets you in the Word. It starts making you seek the Lord. It gets you hungry. It gets you saying, I'm not satisfied with what I do know. I know nothing yet as I ought. I want, I want to see this for myself. You know, I, you know, some people might say, well, I love your teaching on this or whatever. But that's not enough. That's not enough. And I'm still on the edge of my seat to know the Lord in this way and, and have dedicated myself that this is it. This is God. This isn't about God. Chris and I were talking about that the other day. This is God now. We're, we're not in the realms of stuff about God. This is his nature. And to hit the hammer on the head, you got to start right here. So, um, you know, so, so here's this division. And there are some. Isn't that, doesn't that encourage you to know that there are some standing right there? Because um, uh, they had every right to be pulled by the wisdom of this world to say, this is crazy. You're, you're describing us as sheep. And see, Israel knew it better than we do. That if you're a sheep, you know, they know where you're heading. You, you understand? They know you're heading to the altar. Man, they understand this stuff. But these guys said, you know, you know, this, these are not the words of someone demon-possessed. This is not a madman. This is the Lord. This is the truth. All right. Good. We can all we could all sit here and hear that, hear his very words tonight, let it go out, and go, Amen, Amen. But will we be a shepherd for, for Jesus the Lamb, not a hireling? Will we stand up for Christ crucified? Will we, in the face of, you know, and I know that many of you already have, but I'm just, I'm, this is still just the truth, we have to say it. You know, will we, in the face of others saying, well, this is just crazy, and it is crazy, but you have to say, yeah, it's crazy to you, but it's, the, it's not crazy to God. This is the way of God. This selfless, self-giving way. You see what I'm saying? But it's easy to jump on the bandwagon of, well, you know, I mean, the Pharisees, they, they know. We don't know. <laughs> no. Guess what? The Pharisees don't know. <laughs> they rejected Jesus. Okay? The religious leader, the high priests. You know, the only good thing the high priest did that year was he picked the right lamb at Passover. He picked Jesus and had him crucified on Passover. 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just trust you uh, with these things. If they are of you, Lord, I know even as I speak, I know that I say things that could be misconstrued or just flat wrong. I don't know everything, Father. I, I feel so inadequate. Um, but as a, a, a weak earthen vessel, a stammering lips, Lord, I try to hear what your Holy Spirit once said, wants to be said each night and each time. And I know I don't hear everything clearly, but I ask you for the sake of those that are yours, that you will give grace beyond me and that you will lead and feed them and that you will nourish them on these realities as life and not some teaching and not some man and not some organization in Denton, Texas. Father, help each one. I know their hearts love you and they're after you, but Lord, there is such a huge leap between the wisdom of this age and the wisdom that was before all ages. So Lord, as a shepherd, as a pastor, I pray you're covering over them during this week and every week. I pray the presence of your Holy Spirit breaking the truth to them and, and filling them with the reality that when the kingdoms of this world fall, we will rejoice not just in their fall, but in the opportunities that that will bring. How will we ever come to such a heart and such a spirit and such a joy, a rejoicing? Rejoice, you said, for Babylon has fallen. How will we come to such a joy? Because greater will be the opportunities to live Christ crucified. So, Father, I pray you remove all concerns about self, the self being the central focus of our thoughts concerning these things, and that you'll open our hearts to the Christ that already lives within us. It's not something we have to get. It's something that we have to have revealed of his life and nature within us. And Father, for whatever areas I may have gone too far or not said enough, I pray that you'll make up the lack of my weakness and my foolishness. I pray that you'll bring forth your son to your people here and that those that are on Skype and that those would, that would watch the videos or hear the, these things later, Lord, help them and bless them. Protect them until the seed is not just formed, but flourishing. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.